Hi, my name's Keegan, and I'm the host of Engineers in Automation. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with Allie G. She's the owner of Process and Controls Engineering. We're going to talk about her background, how she got started in the automation industry. We're going to talk a lot about growing her business and starting her business in this industry. We're also going to talk about how she's a co-host on a podcast. We're also going to talk about her organization to get more kids into the automation industry. Now let's go talk automation. Welcome to episode 19, and it's a new year. I'm here with the famous Allie G. She is the owner of Process and Controls Engineering. Allie, welcome to today's episode. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure to have you on. I know we've kind of communicated back and forth on LinkedIn for a long time now, so it's great to get some time to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with you. So why don't you just give everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Uh, sure. So I uh, was a, uh, I studied chemical engineering in college and uh, that, you know, was kind of what all I wanted to do was just uh, spend the rest of my life doing chemical engineering. Um, and then about three years in, um, I was part of this layoff and uh, I, you know, had to find something else um, and had me looking for work and there was pretty much only semiconductors and I happened upon a systems integration firm and I didn't know what that was. Um, I just happened upon them and actually they must've, I think I actually applied online. I found them maybe on Indeed or something. One of those, like, cause I was looking everywhere for uh, some kind of job and I was a process engineer, but, um, they were hiring people straight out of school. Um, and turning them into uh, either uh, in, there was called industrial automation engineer or yeah. um, control system specialist. So if you were like from the Navy or you don't have specifically like a, a chemical or an engineering degree, then they could still make you basically the exact same thing. Wow. Um, they just charge you on a different, you know, you charge different because you don't have an engineering degree. But like it's all I swear the work is. I that's controversial when I say that, but um, the uh, yes. the work that of us produce what we were producing like isn't stamped by like a professional engineer. So yes. like that's what makes kind of that difference. But anyway, um, so they were teaching people straight out of school how to do that, and even though I had four years of experience, I was like, well, I've done um, loop checks and I've done some of this stuff that is involved, and um, I had led. Um, some contractors that did that, like either did the controls part or wiring or, you know, trying to actually check out new control systems. Um, and so, yeah, I went, I went and uh, did that job and uh, I didn't last that long. Cause I was, um, I was used to like already being part of a, a greenfield build. Um, and so uh yeah, I guess I wanted more responsibility. So I went and seeked, but I loved like turning into uh, a controls engineer. And so I went and did field engineering because that um, field controls engineering and I would travel around the country um, starting up actually coffee roasters um, and the coffee roasters were like giant industrial people think like brewing coffee. I mean, like burning the green beans, not burning, roasting. Yeah. You're not allowed to say burning, you're roasting <laughs> the beans um but they turn brown right and so right. and there's a lot of um stuff that comes off of them called chaff and, and smoke um uh, but anyway um i started up and i designed a lot of my own systems and then i like started them up and so i kind of got that taste of like what's it like to travel um what's it like to actually like be responsible for starting up your own system that you designed and so kind of got to see those struggles you know between the field engineers and like the design people if, the, if they're not the same people, which a lot of the times there's a giant disconnect there. Um, and then uh, after doing that for a little bit, I got this like amazing opportunity to basically run my own panel shop. And so I was like, I have to do this because like that's just the next like to me, the next level of understanding was like, how do I build control industrial control panels? Yeah. And so I took that opportunity and um, they actually wanted it was a machine shop. It was a, a aerosol machinery that they made yeah. and i um 
Uh, I took them through the process of becoming like a UL certified panel shop. So I worked with their production team and built them their custom control panels. And then, but they were UL listed. So they could actually be, um, yeah, they were to UL spec. And I was trained as the UL gatekeeper to kind of get these uh, machines through. And then, um, yeah, I ended up uh, after that going and working for a architectural and engineering firm. And that's where I learned a lot of the quoting so how to do proposals of like not just engineering work, but also um, uh, like electrical work or design work or commissioning. Like, how do you quote that? What's it going to cost to, uh, to, you know, to do that um, based off very little information? Yeah. Um, and after that, and then being kind of my own project manager, I was like, OK, I've done too much. What What's next? I am one of those people. I, I know there's lots of people like this, but. Um, that are never satisfied or after they learn something, they're just, they need more again yeah. soon, soon afterwards, they need something else again. Even if they conquer something really hard, it doesn't really matter. Cause like the high goes away. And so they're stuck again, finding something else that's really difficult. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why I've kind of ventured into business, but um, this is really hard and it's going to take me a long time to try to conquer. Um yeah. It's not the easiest thing to conquer. I mean, maybe engineering took me and I didn't conquer engineering by any means, um, but I at least got to a point where it was like, I can't really get a whole lot more money uh, on this, these pay scale. I kind of like, I jumped a lot of jobs so I could see yeah. what those numbers were. And um, yeah, so I was like, I kind of want more. And if you want more, well, may maybe that's greedy, but um, if you want more, you can help more people if you get more money. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. my... Um, yeah, but that's kind of my um, really fast background. Maybe maybe too long a background, but no, that's a, that's great. And then um, when and why did you start process and controls engineering? When when did that happen? So it was a long thing in the making, but uh, in 2018, I basically just started it as like a, I have this 400 bucks. And I'm going to invest in it. I literally made like a Delaware corporation <laughs> mm -hmm. online. And, um, but it, but I was like too scared to actually try to go do like business. I was like, I'm not really going to do it. It was like, I don't know, like daring yourself to see if you could just like, I'm like, okay, I own a business. Like I don't, yeah. it doesn't make any money. It doesn't even have a bank account, but <laughs> you know, I, I own a business and it had an EIN. And so I had that business and I paid the, you know, the like corporate taxes for like yeah. three years, three and a half years mm -hmm. um, before I actually like I did three more years basically of like engineering um, full time. Like I wasn't even moonlighting. I wasn't even moonlighting. And I would admit that because I tell people to moonlight and you should, you know, tell your employer that you want to moonlight because they may say you can't and then you can't. But they may say you can. And a lot of them are like, I don't care just don't work on my time, whatever. And they're just like, whatever. So there's yeah. there, it could go both ways for people, by the way. But, um, uh, I was not moonlighting. I, I actually straight up quit my job and said, I'm going to do this. It was, oh, wow. um, with a lot of help from, uh, a friend of mine who did had done the same thing. And so he had, um, you know, gained his engineering knowledge and then, uh, quit his job and, you know, had already, I think four years in, he was in, he was like, you can definitely do this same thing where you could just, you know, have a couple clients and that could sustain your enough money to pay for your normal bills that you're, you're yeah. basically, cause you got to cover your own insurance and your own everything. Right. Yeah. So whatever your, your, whatever your W2 job is covering for you, you at least need that to start. Um, and so that's where people freak out and they're like, oh my God, if I don't have this, if I don't have that. But anyway, um, I did that and, um, uh, I had that friend that was willing to help me. And within two months I had my first $40,000 purchase order. Wow. And so, yeah. And so it usually takes people longer than that. It took um, me six months to get my first <laughs> contract. And then after that, I was a one week contract. And then after that, I think it took me another, I didn't have, so that was in July. I didn't have another one until November. And then since okay, then I've, so I've, I've had one. I uh, I want to I want to blame the the size of my network for finding that customer faster because and I was going to talk about how like you know spit 
speaking of how did you find that customer? Um, it was a plant manager that um, saw that I went out on my own and mm -hmm. came and said, Hey, like, are you worked with me? Uh, do you want to work for me? And I was like, of course I do. <laughs> um, and so it took like months and uh, maybe six weeks or more to get my company through that process yeah. of uh, like, we want, let me see your, your different certificates of insurance, which of course I didn't have. Yeah. Um, so I had to go get those all. And then I actually didn't have exactly, <laughs> I didn't have the numbers, uh, the limits they wanted. So that had to be negotiated. There had to be like, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. There, so, um, but yeah, I learned really fast. Um, and the whole time I'm just thinking like, this is impossible. Like this is, there's no way this will work. Um, and it just keeps, but I like just try it anyway. Cause I'm like, okay with failure. That's maybe one of my biggest strengths is like, I've failed so many times that like, I just know like, oh, well, you know, it'll suck, but done it before and so i get ready to fail a lot and sometimes i don't <laughs> yeah. well, which is really cool good um, for you for being able to pick yourself up then that's awesome yeah well yeah because i'm good yeah i i lose money i've done i've made decisions even now i've only been doing this for two years i have made certain calls uh and learned from them but i've made calls that lost me money yep. um either calls in people or calls in like how i quoted something um, or just like, yeah, just totally like underestimating like revisions, underestimating drawing revisions is hilarious. Like that's a really good way to lose a ton of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's been super fun, uh, losing all this money. I literally consider it like tuition kind of it, it, learning. It's a learning. Yeah. It's learning. Right. I mean, you're paying to learn <laughs> college. Yeah. Yeah. A college it, life. And then um, just a, another question now, how many, uh, it sounds like you've had some employees, some contractors added to your business. How, wh where do you stand there? Um, so I have been able to, I, people are like, oh my God, your company's huge. And it's not, um, it's huge in like, let me count. Like I have my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 16 people. I got to pay on a monthly basis. Yeah. Not all of the, well, 17 people. Um, and not all of, and including me. So 18 people. So if I include me, there's 18 people that got to get paid. Yeah. Um, but, but they're not all full-timers. So if I were to yeah. say like how many, like full-time equivalent is a thing to say like how many, if they were all working full-time, I would have 18 full-time equivalents, but I don't have that. I have yeah. like four or five worked full-time equivalents. And then I just have all these people that help me do different things in a part-time basis. Right. So um, people help me do like automation. I got um, someone, a, a woman named Liza that helped me. Um, oh, I love Liza so much. She helped me uh, get everyone to put their hours into uh, QuickBooks workforce. So now it's spitting out, you know, like automatic. Cause I was doing that myself yeah. for two years. I was putting, I was taking their invoices, their like paper invoices and copying and pasting their hours into my sheet so that I could invoice my customer and be like, okay, there's this many engineering hours, this many project management hours, this many admin hours. And I, so I would be doing all this in Excel and like, that's not automatic at all. That's like an embarrassment. And so I'm having people now help me build these systems, not just doing the engineering, but obviously that's where it started was first giving away some of the engineering um, and then giving away, I'm actually giving away the um, subject matter expert job so that I can actually be a, a real CEO and yeah. not do all that engineering because it does take all of the time. Yeah. Like sitting there and making sure the engineering goes right is a full time job. So I'm like, I'm not I don't want to do that job. I want to build my company and make it bigger. And, um, you know, right now I've cut off. I'm not hiring any more people, even if, though I only have my five time full-time equivalent, whatever. Right. Um, I've also been warned um, that, you know, growing too fast is not a good thing. And, you know, I don't want that either. And so um, I'm not anywhere near as big as people think. Cause like, yeah, they see those 18 people, but like, yeah, they're not all work. A lot of them are students. Um, they're, you know, I will hire them maybe in the future, but like right now they're just kind of like learning to work with me. And like, I am one of those, uh, super hybrid workplaces, um, where, you know, I, 
everyone is remote. I'm not breathing over anyone's neck ever. In fact, they almost miss me. Like they almost like want me to talk to them more <laughs> yeah. than I do. I almost neglect them um, and feel bad because, but I got to let them do some of that stuff on their own. And then, right. um, you know, then I'll come in and just like be mad or whatever and like fix stuff. And then there's, you know, they learn from it and then it just, it, it's going really well. I think um, I know that, I wish I were in more places at once, but I can't be. And that's why I'm really hoping that having like another subject matter expert being on my team, being able to handle like answering them um, will, will somehow save me from, I got to keep them happy. That's number one. Yeah. Um, Cause this is a worker's uh, workforce. So if they don't want to work somewhere, they're not going to. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that for sure. So, and I need them. So, um, yeah. Right. And then uh, are most of your uh, clients then on the West Coast? Um, it sounds like you said a lot of people are doing remote slash hybrid work. Because um, yeah, so you're out I'm in the Portland biggest, area. So is that, is I'm that mostly, focused? Yeah, area? I've made, over the past two years, maybe I've had like, four or five customers, but I have one really like major one that is kind of like, you know, you're not supposed to put all your eggs in one basket, but it's happening that way. And it happens that way for some people. Um, that's why I'm trying to diversify and I have like the subject matter expert, but um, yeah, so I have uh, two right now that are active um, because I've closed out like some other ones that actually, no, I guess I have a third one that wants to engage again. Um, and pot and one like a couple more that are in the like they might turn into projects type yeah. of thing um but like i have a five year government contract and that's the one that i have to staff and like be ready and um have all the insane insurance that one needs 3 million dollars for cybersecurity insurance we um yeah that's not cool <laughs> just kidding <laughs> no and then when i first learned like payroll taxes look like i was like oh that's not cool either yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, this is so much fun. But um, yeah, no, we're actually going to get um, health insurance. And since we're tiny enough, we can do um, small group insurance. I'm going to learn a lot more about that from my sister and like teach people yeah. like little businesses because we all need the health insurance and like we need to give it to people. And like it's really not as bad as I thought. It is expensive, but it's it's yeah, it's the process. It, isn't it's not as horrible. bad. Yeah. yeah. And like they can pay part of it or all of it. Like you can make your employees pay. Um, You should pay, you should cover some of it. Like that's how we kind of had it is like, you know, our employer would cover like half type of thing, but um, yeah. And then, and then covering like dependents is, is cool. Very expensive. Yep. Um, <laughs> But um, it's just part of, just part of this game. We're all slowly moving into it. My first employee didn't need insurance. um, But uh it's time now, like this next one coming, she's going to need it. So we're going to need, we're doing it. We're doing it. <laughs> Good. You're getting there and, and building that business. That's great. Yes. Um, I did want to ask you, what are some of the most difficult challenges that you've seen as a, a small business owner? Um, Trying to do everything yourself. Um, So like trying to do all, like trying to be your own accountant and your own CPA. That's a horrible idea um trying to uh yeah like how long i spent not making not automating the process and making everyone give me like a formatted thing so that i could just like import it like that was terrible so i guess the feedback loop you have to have a really healthy strong feedback loop early on and not be afraid just be like you have to tell them what they have to do um and it's really engineers just want to be like i'll do it myself I'll do it myself. Nope. I'm not going to sit here and show you how to do this uh, because I'm frustrated and because I'm going to do it better anyway. And yeah, that's true. But then you're stuck with this tiny business and you're never, ever going to grow. Yeah. So if you want to grow your business, you have to suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> and you have, and it sucks. It's not, it's, it, it is absolutely painful to try to teach something that you already naturally know. So e like, it's just second nature to us, some of this stuff and to teach that stuff to someone without that experience is I think the most frustrating thing for an engineering business owner, maybe every kind of 
owner because you can't expect anybody to be you and yeah. but you have to give them a chance and you have to let them you have to pay them to fail at tasks that you could have done yourself and but then you're then you will grow but that pain that part is so painful because you're like oh my god i should have done it someone yeah. else should have done it you know or you're like oh my god i'm losing money and it's like yeah. you have to let it go you have to let go of the mistakes they make um and you have to still keep them happy like don't don't also like go and be like trying to ruin their day because they're learning like yeah. And so are you. I'm learning how I'm learning how to be a boss. And, and you know, you're either learning how to do the job or you're learning how to be the boss. But like yeah. we're all just learning and like so the negative stuff is has no place in my business. I, I the uh ruling by fear like has no place. I don't do ultimatums or anything like that. I give you a thousand chances and then if you quit, like that's you know, people yeah. have been doing that, but like whatever. <laughs> Well, like, it, that's that's great advice, though, and that's especially as a small business owner and an engineer myself. That is also one of the hardest things to do is just to let go and to delegate. Right? It's yeah. uh, definitely hard to do. I and did want to yourself ask, when they fail because they will. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. Work. That's that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point. Um, I did want to ask you though. You have such a massive following now on LinkedIn. What do you equate all of your success to? Um, so I, because I offered, um, like at first I offered help. It didn't seem like help, but it was, um, I was curating, um, YouTube videos. And so I was building this gigantic network of like people that I knew worked in my sector somehow. So mm -hmm. you either were like another engineer, another controls engineer or a process engineer or an electrician or a panel builder or a maintenance, you know, manager. And I just started adding all these people. But what I was posting was not my own content. It was actually um, curating YouTube content because I was so impressed by what was there and I wanted people to know that that was there. Wow. So I was like, like the inside of a centrifuge, like the working animation of like literally anything ev that I've ever seen inside of a plant, a solenoid valve, pumps, valves, yeah. piping, uh, servos, proximity switches. Like it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And I've, um, I, I even got into like bending conduit. I'm like, look how to make these different offsets. Like it just, there was so much information on there. And I was like, why? It's so sad that like some people will even like ask me to Google something for them. And I Google it so fast and they're so thankful. And I'm like, this is all available to everybody. Yeah. Um, And so I started just being like, I have to show this. And so that was my first interest was like, I wanted to do it on Facebook. And I was like, no one cares. So I was like, I'm going to do it to this random community because they press like, and for some reason they were as nerdy as me. So it was an outlet. Um, and then I figured out that they were taking it well because um, they just liked it and they kept adding me. And so then someone, that same person that like helped me start my business also told me like, Hey, you see how good of a following you have when you curate other people's stuff. What happens if you post your own content and yeah. make your own content and just tell people about what you do. Literally, that's it. Just tell people about what you do. Yep. And I was like, well, I can do that. And um, and then so I, I have these PLCs behind me, right? Someone else, a different person said to me something like, you know, oh, you're you're a controls engineer and you want to be an influencer and uh, which I didn't even want to be an influencer, but um, they're like, you want to have this presence. I'm like, but you don't even have like, you know, like uh, you don't have your own, what was it called? Your own little like lab slash shop, yeah. whatever. And I was like, I can get PLCs like to mount behind me. And so I built like the turbo encabulator. Like I had so much hardware. I was like, okay, I can show hardware and my face. Like this is stupid. Yeah. Um, but it helped. It helped um, kind of build a brand. Um, and then the hat thing, I didn't want anything to do with the hat thing. And then I was like, oh, I get the hat thing now, but cause I understood the like branding thing. Yeah. And so I guess I just, this was like, this has been a social experiment gone wrong or right. If you want to call it right, I guess. Yeah, I think it's um, gone pretty but, right um, for you. 
<laughs> that's what um that's where it came from is um i do have a way to, uh, to connect with pretty much anyone i can talk to um anyone pretty much about anything i don't know why um i think it's um my parents are like that they're salespeople. um yeah i don't know good quality to have in this industry and speaking of meeting people let's briefly talk um how did you meet Nikki? And then how did you, you girls start Automation Ladies? <laughs> um, I I knew I had talked to her before, but I hadn't really. I know a lot of people, right? A lot of people talk to me and um, or try to talk to me. And some people I try, I used to talk back to everyone and then the numbers got too big. Um, and I feel really bad and there's guilt related to that. But um, Nikki was, um, first of all, I saw her a little bit, but like I didn't really pay too much attention. And then. Um, she messaged me because I was posting about, um, pack expo. So I was posting like all these robots from pack expo. And she was like, you know, that's so cool that like, we get to basically be there because you're posting these and we get to see the stuff and then we can still ask the questions. Like, yeah. so she was basically thanking me for like posting about pack expo because it because it had been a while and also it had you know it was like during covid so it was like you know meanwhile we're all kind of just still like don't know what it's yeah human human contact we had all fi not forgotten yeah. what that was like yeah. and um so yeah so it was i guess it was partially that it was like thanks for showing us again that like we we can still have like these trade shows <laughs> <laughs> are coming it's, back to life yeah still um, get out of our house right um, yeah. And, and how do you, how do you girls then, um, you know, bring on guests? How do you select guests for your, for your show? Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, we, we had differing views on that and, uh, I wanted, you know, certain people and slash groups and, um, what actually ends up working better is, um, just letting them come to you. Um, mm -hmm. and so there's actually a lot of, companies that will just show up after you so you have to but you have to get the ball rolling right yeah. but that's kind of how we've been doing it is our policy is actually we're not we don't really go looking much for it unless they're already like related to some other like organization that we're already like you know like talking to yeah. so it's a lot of just like yeah it's it's different than the way i do engineering business where i'm like i you know i actually do want to go after um for the sales part but like for these shows uh we kind of want people that already um, see themselves in us because, um, mm -hmm. you know, there, we have had like sponsorships uh, that didn't go um, perfect. And, you know, we just we need to jive, you know, vibe with the people. Yeah. So, yeah, um, they're usually like other people on marketing teams. Um, you know, that's kind of like the 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 people that you tend to or or owners if they're small businesses mm -hmm. business owners will come to us but a lot of the times if it's a larger corporation it's you know the their their marketing teams and so they have values that you know vibe with ours um yeah yeah, yeah that i guess that makes sense um and then also i definitely want to touch on you are uh the founder of another organization again it seems like you got your hands a little bit everywhere in kids plc kits can you talk about that i'm excited for that i just had a daughter recently so looking forward to getting her into some of this automation and robotic stuff but can you talk a little bit about that yes so the need's been there um and people have their opinions on it but like we have a uh what is it? A skills gap because we told all the you know people not to go to the trade school and to get a college degree. And then we told them, you know, like even high school teachers were like, uh, oh, you're so smart. Why would you go get a trades? You know, why would you go to trade school if you're so smart? Like, because yeah. they're going to make way more money. No, but um, yeah. So and not have we, to pay for college, right? <laughs> for real. And so we did this reverse terrible psychology game on uh, you know, young people. And now that they've all entered the workforce, they don't have those um, uh, skills. And so I randomly happened upon them. And we've like, you know, my other podcast has found that everyone is accidentally finding uh, controls, which is horrible, um, but also other trades, but whatever. So we're focusing on automation and industrial controls and um, people are not finding that except on accident. And we want to change that to on purpose. So how do you do that? Well, 
uh, we, we, we're not going to like go, we're not going to get anywhere, uh, with the people that are already out there. I mean, we're trying that anyway, but we're going to have to do something to the incoming workforce. Yeah. So that's where you go and like at middle schoolers and high schoolers. And then you look at other, com- other countries like Germany, you could be, by the time you finish your trade school, you could have like 10 years or something of experience because they were doing it in school. Like mm-hmm. we can have our high schoolers learning how to wire control panels. There is no reason why we couldn't yeah. do that. Yeah. And also how to program, like, let's be serious. Like can a, can a high school student program a pump station? My answer is yes. And I could even say that a middle schooler could, depending on the middle schooler, but we'll just leave it at high schoolers for now. But the point is that um, I met this girl named Jordan. So uh, this girl, I met her dad, Jordan Day. This girl's name is Elena Day. And she was nine and now she's 10. Um, But she was nine years old when I sent her her first PLCs. And her dad, because he is a master plumber and master HVAC, and he helps the schools with like their building automation systems. So he can dabble. He understands like the the concept behind like a PLC and like communications because of his background. And so I started sending them stuff and it got to the point where she created this video. She has a, a channel called Little Miss Fix It. And there were already amazing videos. She was already amazing, right? This was, yeah. she, I'm not taking any credit for her. She's incredible. Um, but she was fixing, um, replacing toilets, right? This is like master plumber stuff, right? Replacing yeah. toilets, um, rewiring um, the dishwasher and putting a new dishwasher in and doing the wiring and everything and the plumbing for the dishwasher. So then I sent her this stuff. And of course they, and I didn't expect it to be like this, but I sent her um, a, basically an HMI and a PLC starter pack and they brought compressed air into her room so they could use the solenoid that I gave them. She was wiring. She, she had, there's a video there. There's two, three videos. Like now she has an analog card and like a, a transmitter. But anyway, she was able to shoot a little air rocket in her room Um and after that, after I saw that video, I was like, we have to replicate this. And that's what Kids PLC Kids is, is how do you put the hardware from that they're going to see in the factory so that when they go to the factory, they're like, oh, my God, I've seen this before. Like, I know what this does. I know how to use this. Um, I think it will be an incredibly empowering thing but it's a long game. So right now we're just, we have all this hardware. And and so because of my following, I'm able to get like, you know, partnerships with companies and say, Hey, Hey Siemens, give me PLCs. Hey Phoenix contact, give me PLCs. Cool. Hey Pat light, give me stack lights. Um, Hey people give me, give me stuff. And it started as, Hey, just give me, I know you guys have hardware from extra projects. Just give me that. And it grew from that to, we have shipments of brand new everything because the companies want to, uh show kids the, their brand names because that's what you should be doing right now yep. and um so everyone's kind of joining in this effort and that's it is a nonprofit it is official 501c3 nonprofit um that is trying to uh do something about do something trying to do something everyone's talking about it right we got to do something um and how are, and then, and then it also kind of gets in people's mind heads cuz they're like wait how can this little girl be 10 years old and be better than like some technicians. And it's like, you know, because we got to get ourselves because kids are better than us. That's just a thing. Yeah. Like, and I I'm excited to see what these kids that come out of these programs are going to do because I fully expect them to whoop us at our own games. Yeah. Yeah. People say that I'm like breeding the, not breeding, but I'm like creating my own competition. And I, I don't feel that way. We'll see. Well, hopefully you'll be retired by the time they uh, come up, right? <laughs> I doubt it. They'll take care of me. They'll give me a job. I'll be fine. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's great. Um, and and I guess uh, one last thing here before we wrap up, um, you know, where can people connect with you? How can they get in touch with you? Obviously, I think we briefly talked about, you know, your LinkedIn following. Um, is that the best place to get a hold of you? It is. Um, but I also, yeah, I have my website, uh, pce.llc. Um, and then you can also talk to um, automationladies.io. 
Okay. Um, and then, you know, come donate at um, www.kidsplckits.org. Cool. Cool. And we'll put links in the description to all those places. So we'll make cool. sure that if people want to go to those yeah, places, LinkedIn they'll is a good be one. able to do that. So I hope everyone enjoyed today's episode here with Allie. I know I did. If you did, please give us a like, comment, share, and don't forget to subscribe. And we hope you join us here next time on Engineers and Automation. Thanks.